Greetings. This is a very short lecture on uh, spatial pattern analyses. This week we're going to be exploring point pattern analysis and spatial autocorrelation and the tools that we can use in GIS to unearth this kind of information about our data. Uh, we're talking about statistical models we can use to determine whether distributions of features are from random processes or if there's evidence that there's some other process causing a non-random pattern in the features. So first recall that spatial analysis investigates the contextual relationships among features, where on the other hand, spatial statistics examines the numerical relationships of features that we can use to uncover geographic patterns in the data. Um, yeah, so moving into it. All right, so what is spatial statistics? It's basically an extension of traditional statistics. We're talking about applying methods that use distance, space, and information about spatial features to assess patterns, trends, and relationships among features. Why would we want to do this? Well, uh, because it's going to help us better understand our data. It's going to help us better understand spatial phenomena. Um, it's going to help pinpoint causes of non-random patterns. Uh, it might make decision-making um, easier or at least give us uh, higher levels of confidence with our decision-making. And most importantly, it just flat out helps us simplify things. We can take very complicated uh, scenarios and summarize them with a single number, which doesn't mean it's easy to do. It just means it's possible to do. Okay, so we're focusing on analyzing spatial patterns in this set of exercises this week. And there's two basic approaches. The first one is to um, analyze features and their spatial distribution, just very simply location. We'll identify characteristics of a distribution and answer questions like, where is the geographic center? Or how are features distributed around the center, right? So just plain old location. These local tools, like average nearest neighbor or uh, Ripley's K function tell us if spatial features are clustered or randomly distributed on a landscape. Those are kind of the key words. Um, these tools measure geographic distributions and deal only with feature location. Okay, the second way, the second type of analysis addresses spatial autocorrelation. And this is the idea that near things tend to be more related to one another. Okay, we're going to use tools like Moran's eye and hotspot analysis to quantify spatial patterns based on their attributes or the values associated with a, each location. So it's not just the location anymore, like in the first scenario, which is um, location-based distributions, but now we're going to incorporate some other measurement or value about the location to look for causative or descriptive relationships about the locations. All right. So, spatial patterns are commonly described, like I said, as being either uniform, random, or clustered. And the simplest way to visualize this is to perform something called a quadrat analysis, in which you lay this kind of uniform grid over the study area, and then look at the features per cell. If all the grid cells have, um, on average, the same number of points, the distribution is considered random. So you can see here that uh, on, on average we have about one feature per cell. If some cells show that they have a lot of points and some have none, this is um, what is dis uh, described as a clustered distribution. And then the distribution is considered to be uniform if all the points are evenly dispersed and equally spaced, like you can see here. Uh, to illustrate this and to relate it to the first tool you're going to be using in this lab this week, say we're going to measure the distance from every point to its nearest neighbor. Those are the distances that are displayed in these histograms. Uh, the uniform distribution shows the exact same distance to all its nearest neighbors. So every single point has the same distance and that's why you end up with just this one value in the histogram. The randomly distributed points will have their distances to the nearest neighbors. They're going to peak at the same mean value as the uniform distribution, but there's going to be deviations that occur by chance. So on average, 
a random distribution is defined as one where the mean is going to be the same as a uniform distribution, but there's just going to be some slight deviations in getting the random pattern. Uh, when points are clustered, the overall mean distance to the nearest neighbor is going to be lower, right? Because we're going to have more opportunities, more situations where the nearest neighbor distance is less than the random mean. And there's going to be fewer instances where the nearest neighbor distance is farther than the mean. Does that make sense? The distribution is going to be skewed to shorter distance values because we have more of them that are closer, and that's what equals the clustering. There's going to be fewer locations with larger than the random mean distances to their nearest neighbor, and we end up with this kind of squatter version of a random distribution. All right, so when we analyze spatial patterns, we're looking to answer some basic questions like, are features organized in some kind of systematic pattern? Or are they randomly distributed? Is there a pattern to the pattern? Does the pattern have a pattern? Is there a scale at which the pattern emerges or becomes meaningful? And at the simplest level of analysis, we're only concerned about the physical pattern in the spatial location, not whether there's a correlation between the location and some attribute or value associated with that location. So we're going to talk about those tools first and the tools that we use to do something called point pattern analysis. The first tool is called average nearest neighbor. It's the most basic way that we can begin seeking information about spatial distribution. Um, this tool calculates the distance to the nearest neighbor for every feature. Uh, it averages the distances and then compares that average or mean distance to what we would expect the mean distance to be if those same number of points were randomly distributed over the same spatial extent. Does that make sense? <laughs> it returns, this tool specifically returns five values. Uh, it it uh, returns an observed mean distance of our data, so it goes in, like I said, and calculates the distance for every point to its nearest neighbor, uh, and then averages them. Um, it also uh, returns the expected mean distance, uh, sorry, expected mean distance given that theoretical random distribution of the same number of points over the same spatial extent. So what it would be if they were truly random. Um, it outputs a nearest neighbor index, which is just the ratio of those observed to the expected means. And I'll talk about more, that, more about that in one second. It also outputs a z-score and a p-value. And so just remember that the p-value is a probability. It's the probability that the observed spatial pattern was created by some random process. Or in other words, when a p-value is really small, there's a very low probability that the pattern is random. The z-score represents standard deviations. So it's the difference between a value and the mean of all the values assuming a normal distribution. Um, a z-score of zero means that a value is the same as the mean of all the values in the data set. And in our case, it compares the mean of our distances to the mean of the distances for a random distribution. And so we're looking for high z values. We want to be outside of that bell curve. Okay, don't freak out about this. <laughs> this is the equation, don't freak out. <laughs> it just demonstrates that the observed mean distance uh, between each feature of our data set is divided by the expected mean difference uh, of each feature and its nearest neighbor in the theoretical random distribution over the same space. So what it's saying, this is how we get the average nearest neighbor index. It's saying that a nearest neighbor index of less than one indicates clustering, especially if it's accompanied with a very low p-value. Remember, we, uh, the probability that the distribution will uh, resemble a random one. With low p-values and high, here we go, let me put this in here. Uh, with low p-values and high absolute values of z-scores, so in this zone here, we're talking about um, this kind of confidence level out here in the tails of the distribution. Out here, the results are meaningful or significant with low p-values and high absolute z-scores. And I mean absolute because we're talking about being lower than negative 1.96 or something like that. If, if for example, the z is below negative 1.96 or above 1.96. It's like saying that we're 95% confident that the distribution is not randomly distributed. Okay, does that, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's kind of a recap for you um, on confidence value measures. 
just so you have some concept. But know that you can you can look all this stuff up. There's great webs, uh, websites out there describing some of these basic statistical things and some obviously great YouTube videos if you need a little crash course in um, basic statistics. So uh, average nearest neighbor. One limitation to using this tool is that it's very dependent on the size of the processing area. ARC does, if you look at the tool, give you the option to insert your own area value. You would just want this to be in the same units um, as your coordinate system of the data that you're uh, working in. And you just would want it to be bigger than a rectangle defined by uh, the maximum extent. So yeah, like I'm saying, the default value that ARC is going to use if you don't put anything in here is the minimum enclosed rectangle that encompasses all the features. It's kind of like the convex hull that you did in the last lab, but instead of creating an irregular polygon shape, it just does a rectangle defined by the min and max x and y coordinates of the data. So um, it is, but that area does uh, really impact the results. And if you're going to do this for your own research, you should probably experiment with uh, using just ARC's uh, calculated rectangle and then putting in um, different larger areas. Um, uh, the nearest neighbor tool also ignores global patterns, which means patterns defined by the entire data set. And instead, it's considered a local tool because it only considers the effect um, of, or I should say, the distance to the nearest neighbor of each feature. But what if the tool could look at the distance to the nearest n neighbors, like the distance to the nearest 10 or 20 neighbors, or if you could set a buffer width, which would be like a bandwidth around each feature and measure uh, the distances to those nearest neighbors. So that kind of tool does exist. It's called the Ripley's K function. Um, the tool, it's a multi-distance tool in the spatial statistics toolbox. And if you want to experiment with that, you should absolutely uh, give it a try. It does get into, um, just like I said, a more global look at the data. And you can tease out some different patterns. OK, uh, kernel density estimates. We did this in the last lab. And I just want to talk about it a little bit because it is very similar to that uh, Ripley's K function that I was just telling you about. You've run it before, and you're going to run it in this lab again on our new data set. It tells you the density of the, of the events within a specified search radius around each event. And again, that search radius has to, is the bandwidth. That's what we mean by a search radius. The bandwidth um, defines the overall shape of the base of these kernels. The kernel is just a moving three-dimensional function that defines the shape of this moving kind of lump <laughs> uh, with that radius um, or bandwidth. So the kernel basically sweeps around and visits each point in the study area. And then the resulting density surface that we get, that output raster, is the accumulation of all the additive kernel depths. Um, I'll show you a better picture of that in a second. Um, this is an interesting image, not because it's got equations on it, but because it shows the shapes of the different kernels. So if you remember from that GME lab in the Coyote exercise, the KDE tool gave us the option to use different kernel shapes. The default one was Gaussian, um, but you should know that Cortic is also a really common kernel shape. It's very similar. It's just uh, obviously taller. These are the equations that define the, the uh, kernel size and shape, or not size, but shape. Um, and also remember they're three-dimensional. Um, and also, just so you know, the, the size of the bandwidth is a tough thing to deal with, and it really depends on the entity that you're trying to map densities of. Um, but uh, anyway, you, you do need to experiment with it. There's just not a lot of agreement on how or what the best band, bandwidth is for any given scenario. Um, yeah, anyway, so those are the different shapes. And then this, I think, is also a good image because it helps us see how the intensity um, of, or the density surface values are derived. The individual events each have their own kernel shape, right? Here, these are just, again, shown two-dimensionally, but in reality, they're three-dimensional. Um, a lot of um, people kind of liken them to having a column of sand, and then you remove the boundary, and it just kind of lumps and, and falls down to this angle of repose. And this shape is what's defined by those different uh, cordic or Gaussian equations I showed you on the last slide. So each one of these things is an event. 
or like a coyote location, and each one has its own kernel shape, three-dimensionally, and then um, each one of the overlapping uh, kernel shapes is, is sort of theoretically summed in this additive way, and this larger value is what's displayed as our density estimation. It's like an intensity. Um, yeah, so the results, again, are sensitive to that change in bandwidth. When the bandwidth or radius is larger, the intensity is going to appear smoother. You're going to get smoother results on your output KDE surface. The local details tend to be more obscured. But when the bandwidth is small, um, they end up uh, looking very spiky, and that output uh, intensity or density surface has a lot of local spikes. So again, if you're going to do this for your own research, you should definitely experiment with um, with either the, both the bandwidth and the kernel shape. Okay, so nearest neighbor and kernel density estimates can be used to determine spatial distributions and patterns based exclusively on the feature locations. It's just a very uh, straightforward um, kind of thing. Nearest neighbor, kernel density estimates, Ripley's K function. These are all ways to determine spatial distributions based on the location alone. Next, uh, we want to discuss tools that will help us understand the degree to which near and distant things are related based on the similarity of their attributes or values associated with those locations. So we're going to add a new dimension. 